Hey everybody and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host Ashley Mova and this is The Daily Show where we give you all of the latest news from the world of movies plus some insight into what it all means. It is a full his house today <laughs> and leading off the show is Denizen. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another brand new episode of Collider Movie Talk. And Ashley says we have a full house today. So, and, and there wasn't that much news that dropped. So, we're going to have a, a full mailbag show with a little box office predictions in there. Also, here, Clark Wolf. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me back, guys. Also, here, Mark Ellis. Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me back, too. <laughs> <laughs> also, here's Christian Harloff. Oh, hi, Dennis. <laughs> so I still haven't seen that movie. I still want to watch it. The, the room. room. Yeah, you've got to watch it with Everyone a lot of people. Me, oh hi, and I'm like, you know what? I watched a little bit of the clip. It's hilarious. Oh hi, doggy. <laughs> <laughs> you sound like the old man molester from Family Guy. Thanks. Hey, Dennis. <laughs> Real nice. All right. Hey, first, I'm gonna tell people what you were saying off the air. <laughs> first question comes from Matthew Spencer, and they write, "Hey there, Collider. <laughs> Greetings from Vermont. You guys have been talking about if Episode Seven will break the box office opening weekend of Jurassic World, and I agree with you that it will be tough. The weather aspect could hold it back, but do you think Episode Eight has a chance since it's releasing in May with good weather and the potential boost of the success?" of the other two movies, if they're good, can we see it jump to number one? Thanks. Yeah, I think it has a great chance. I think the episode seven, if it wasn't in December, if it had come out in May or June, it probably would have broken the records. Assuming that seven is pretty good and Rogue One doesn't stink, then I think eight will break the box office weekend records. Christian, what do you think? I think it absolutely has a chance, um, especially if episode seven is good. Because yes. even if Rogue One is terrible, and episode seven is good. This is the sequel. It's the follow up. And because it lands in May, you absolutely have a chance to go over that 215. And because of the weather and everything else, there's a great chance. I think that being in December for episode seven helps its chances to to be the overall movie of all time because of having nothing to compete with from, oh, sorry, chipmunks, but from <laughs> December until like February. <laughs> but I think that even though it might be a little tougher for episode eight to beat the, the all time record because of all the competition in summer, the opening weekend is definitely possible. Mark? Yeah, I think episode eight has a decent shot to break the record of episode seven's opening weekend mm -hmm. take because episode seven will break the all-time record. I don't care <laughs> what month it comes out. Episode seven is going to do it. Oh, is it snowing a little bit? It doesn't matter because Star Wars is in theaters and you want to go see it opening weekend so you can tell all your friends you got to see it with them first. And if it's all snowed in, you can call Mark Ellis. He'll come and shovel the snow <laughs> yeah. for you I'm so you can get to. into the theater. I'm in the prime of my life. I'm in great snow shoveling shape. <laughs> I'll go to Vermont. <laughs> Not after all the popcorn you eat from watching episode seven. I did. Eat, I did put on some weight this summer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you, Mark Ellis. I think that uh, I think that there's a chance. I, I know it's Christmas. I know the weather might hold people back, but I think that people are really, really excited about this movie, and I think it could be the biggest. How crazy would it be too if both top movies came out in one year? Yeah, it would be, it would be amazing. But I just I, look. I, there's no one I think at the table that would want this thing to. Make I wanted to make four hundred million dollars opening weekend. It's just because it's not only just cold weather. It's because of shopping and everything else. And remember, the only movie to ever no movie has even cracked a hundred million in December. No movie has cracked ninety million in yeah. December. Um, so I and think this it'll, will it'll certainly do say, that. If it will do certainly it. do that. I I'm I still think it'll do about one eighty five two hundred. I think tops, but I hope I hope I am dead wrong because of shopping. Because yeah. of it's, shopping. It's absolutely possible. Yeah. St. Yes. Nick is giving the elves the day off so they can go see <laughs> The Force Awakens on the 17th or the yeah. 18th or whatever the hell it's coming out in America. I don't even know the date yet, but whenever it comes out, we're all going to be there. So will you. You know it's true. I think 170. Yeah. 170. What yeah. do you think? I couldn't even begin to. $300 million. million? Oh. <laughs> I'm going 235. Okay. I'll say 190. Okay. And then we, we had talked about uh, the, the trailer opening. We I guess it hasn't been officially confirmed, but more sources are coming in saying that the trailer is coming Monday, a poster coming Sunday. What else did we hear about that, Chris? Um, just look, there's a lot of rumors that it might be because Mark and I talked about this on Jedi Council yesterday as well, is that. A, Disney owns ESPN as well. Monday Night Football is on tomorrow night. The ticket sales, there's conflicting reports. Some people think that the, the, that the ticket sales will go on at 8 mm -hmm. e Eastern Standard Time, and some people say 8.30, and then the trailer will drop around 8 o'clock. So th that, to me, makes sense. It, it, 
it sucks because I want to see it in the morning, but it's fine if I'm watching the Giants and then it happens to come on. I'm okay with that. But um, as a yeah. Giants fan, it'll give you something good to happen. Well, in you the know game. that we won the last three games, right? <laughs> Congratulations. How's your quarterback really doing? Proud of your right, team. Nice. He's doing fine. Mr. Glass over there. And then also we're, we're trying to plan something here where we do a live reaction to the trailer, assuming that we kind of know when it's coming out right, right i mean i think you'll probably see the trailer around 5 p.m uh west coast time and then tickets are going to go on sale around 5 30 so you're going to see the trailer get excited high five your friends maybe see it a couple other times if it's released online at the same time then you can go buy your tickets after that i think espn might be doing this is at least what we're hearing they might be doing a whole star wars e theme mm -hmm. monday night football episode so it makes sense to do it at 5 p.m which is right before the game kicks off when the eagles beat the giants and then after you buy your pre-order tickets, then you can come here, watch our live reaction, and then I'm, I'm sure Christian, Mark, and John oh, yeah. will probably do a special Jedi Council just sense. analyzing yeah. every single frame, frame. every yeah. frame, yeah. every yeah. sound yeah. effect, every yeah. little tiny What detail. does that hat mean? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. What's next? Cable 7 writes, hey, Collider, my question for you is, do studios have their say as to how long a particular film has to be, or is it the director? What are your thoughts? Thanks. It's, it's mostly the studio. They don't have a set time in terms of like, we need this to be in one hour, 52 minutes and 30 seconds, but they probably have a cap because they want a bigger return on their investment. They want, you know, movies playing over and over and over. And the shorter it is, the more sh screen times they can have. Um, I think even with directors that have final cut, they still have like some sort of like time cap, like uh, Wolf of Wall Street. I think the original cut was like over four hours. And they had, and yeah. God, I want that That's version. That's a lot of F-bombs. Yes. I really want that version. And so Scorsese had to cut it down to, what it was a little over three? Yeah. Three and a half. Yeah. Three and a half. <laughs> hey, those three and a half flew by so, for me. Me too. Um, <laughs> me too. But, but there's even someone as powerful as him, they, they, they have a, something they have to get under. So they're not necessarily telling him, oh, you have to cut this part or that part, but you got to put it under. You guys hear anything different? I mean, you, you bring up a great point with the studios that I think they generally would always prefer a 90-minute movie yeah. regardless of what it is. But sometimes when you're working with a director like a Scorsese or in the comedy world and Apatow who have had so many successful movies come out that they get a little more leeway when it comes to how long you want your movie. Or even when we were talking about if J.J. Abrams, who, who has final cut of episode seven, that movie's going to be a little over two hours, and I think that they want that to be. that That's about the running time they want. They don't want it to be any longer than that. That fits with the rest of the Star Wars movies that have come out. But but studios want it to be shorter and shorter. I mean, they, the studios also know when they see a script as well, too. Like when, when the script's bought, when, it, when it's in development. Normally, if a script's 120 pages, then it looks like it's going to be a two-hour movie. Um, and then depending on the director and what the director's vision's like, they know. Like when you like you mentioned, Dennis, when you have Scorsese in there, you know you're probably going to get an over two-hour movie. And you're probably aware of it. It depends on what, what season it comes out, when it comes out, who the target audience is. Like, and again, when it comes to like kids' movies, they also know the kids' attention span, so they know that they try to cut that cut it down. And, and it's, it's just a matter. It's a case by case. It really is. Did you guys hear that uh, Quentin Tarantino said that the Hateful Eight will have an intermission? Oh, is it definitely yeah. Yeah. like like Lawrence of Arabia? Yeah, like yeah. You're, you're like okay. Which you know, I, first of all, I think movies are. I kind of want to sound like a grandma, but I think movies are too long mm -hmm. nowadays. I don't understand why every movie has to be two hours and fifteen minutes. It feels like. But with that being said, with Tarantino, like you were saying, I think feel like you know you're gonna need to strap in because right. it's gonna be a long movie. But I kind of love the idea, especially because Tarantino is such a cinephile, for lack of a better mm -hmm. word, that he's actually going to put an intermission in his movie. Yeah, I think that that's great. He it's, is so in love with all the old school tricks really that he's really using is. for Hateful Eight. I hope it doesn't overtake the actual quality of the movie, but I'm very excited for a Hateful Eight. Christian, you brought up a really interesting point. Is that it's seasonal, maybe? W which month do you think is the record for most 90-minute movies? It's got to be February. January. 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 Yeah. 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 It's like, just Did get it, this crap yeah. over. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. But you know, the other thing, the one thing about the Tarantino thing is, I, look, I love Tarantino, and I can't wait to see Hateful Eight. I hate the idea of intermission. I just because really? the reason why not not because of the nostalgia purposes. The the idea of like old school theater, yeah, of course it's romantic. It's 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 great in that aspect. But I want to be I'm going to be so sucked into Tarantino's movie, and then it's like oh, go back into reality for a little for like 15, 20 minutes, and then come back and and, and start all over again. And it's like it sucks you out of it. But you but might have to pee. Uh, the, the, the run movie. away. But and also, don't you feel like he's kind of? I mean, if anybody knows how to pace his audience, of course he does. I'm gonna be, him. I'm gonna be jumped right back into it once it starts again. But I just, I want to be, I don't want to be like this and go. Uh. 
Oh, yeah. and then I'm going to be talking to somebody else. What do you think I so a, far? I have a feeling that he's not going to cut it abruptly. I have a feeling he's probably going to, you know, take it down a little bit and then ease yeah. you into your intermission. Or maybe not. Maybe he'd just be like, something crazy will happen and he'll cliff, leave on a cliffhanger. I know what your issue is. Your issue is that you're afraid of walking out of the theater in Hateful Eight and then having 20 minutes to yourself seeing Star Wars episode and seven. And he's like, <laughs> look, I'm looking around. I'm like, well, wait a minute. I'll come back to this. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of which, by the way, there's a report. Um, IO9 says that there's a rumor that the advance tickets for episode seven might go on sale today. Uh, wow. That's a rumor, wow. though. Okay. All right. What's next? Harry Green writes, hey, Collider crew, looking forward to another great movie talk session today, guys. Hey, which actor would you say has had the greatest transformation slash arc in a film? I think of roles such as Darth Vader, Malcolm X, and Jean Valjean. Malcolm X seemed like he went through three arcs in that film, from being bad to radical to righteous. But I still contend that Jean Valjean was the best performance I've seen to date. Thanks and keep up the great work. Well, Darth Vader would have had one of the greatest character arcs in cinematic history until we saw the prequels, right. which yeah. did not... Story-wise, it, it, it sounds really cool. Execution-wise, not so much. My choice is Michael Corleone from yeah. The Godfather, the, the first one. Just his character. You remember in the beginning, he's telling Kay the whole time, no, Kay, it's not me. It's, you know, it's my family. It's my father. I don't do that. Da, da, da. And then you know, towards the end, he's shooting people in the head and leaving the country and doing all kinds of gangster stuff. Well, what about you guys? Uh, I mean, when you think about transformations, I got to go the human centipede cast. I mean, that's a pretty <laughs> epic thing what they went through. Um, I'll do a classic one. I'll take George <laughs> Bailey and It's a Wonderful Life. Uh, I think that, obviously, with the help of the angel. Uh, Phil Connors in Groundhog yes, Day. Bill Murray's character. One. And I'll also throw uh, Aaron Eckhart as Harvey Dent. Oh, in, nice. uh, not, not just the facial thing, but also because like, he was like such a guy that yeah, stood for justice. Sure. And then all of a sudden, he maybe wasn't in the last part of that movie. Well, if it was a movie, you could easily say Walter White. I'll tell you that. Yeah. Uh, but I'm going to go uh, oh, Le good. Leon from The Professional because Leon was a guy that there, there was just one shade to him and he was just this kind of, I wouldn't say brainless, but just just this machine of a killer. And this little girl comes into his life and then what the arc of where he went at the end of what his sacrifice was, I thought was a great, uh, great arc. Yeah, Clark? mine are all uh, genre genre picks as well. I thought of Ellen Ripley uh, in the first Alien oh, movie, yeah. and and of course two Aliens. Um, and I thought of uh, Seth Brundle in The Fly, Jeff Goldblum oh, right. in The Fly. I mean, talk about a transformation. Actually, you saying Walter White is what reminded me because uh, I have a, a, I have a theory yeah. that they're yeah that uh. they're like parallel characters. And uh, Sarah Connor. Sarah oh, Connor yeah. has Sarah a crazy Kama. transformation yes. arc. So um, yeah, you know who else does is yeah. uh, is is Arnold at the end of Terminator Two because he's yeah. this machine and he, he learns sure. some some human things. He does a thumbs up. Well, I would also say Michael Fassbender's Magneto in in First Class mm -hmm. also because Ooh, that's a good mm -hmm. one. Because, and I, I reference this all the time. That's kind of what I wanted to see happen to Anakin Skywalker. I think that would have been a good if if that was actually Anakin, <laughs> then Darth Vader would be no contest here. He'd be the, he'd be the one to uh, to vote for. But yeah, just there's something that. That scene of him when he's when he's younger in World War II in the camp, and then you know, then finding the those Germans, having his revenge, and then looking like Xavier is going to get him out of this and turn him towards the good side, and then he goes right back to what he thinks is the right cause. I got one more. Uh, the main character in the Descent. Have you guys seen the Descent? Neil Marshall's mm, movie. Okay, no. well, for the people watching, if you're looking for a scary pick for Halloween, uh, The Descent, it, don't look up anything about it. Don't read any spoilers. Don't look at any pictures. Just watch the movie, and you will see the main character has a huge transformation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, while I love great uh, character arcs, I don't think they are the end all be all of like movies. Because sometimes some pe some people watch a movie and they're like, "Well, that guy didn't really change that much," or something like that. One of my favorite movies is uh, Aronofsky's *The Wrestler*. And if you watch no that, way. that's not about his character transforming, or uh, he tries to, but ultimately he can. That's kind of like one of his failings. So I don't think it's 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 whether or not you get a good character story arc. That's why I was saying like with the prequels with Darth Vader and Anakin, that's not necessarily a good one. 
Yeah, there's like sometimes it, like when you think of a great character arc, you think of like the violent swing from like one like, like you know Saul becoming Paul or something like that. But even just the little tinges like William Money and Unforgiven, right. where you just get a little shade of something else that maybe you didn't see before. Those are some of the best. Or Chief ones. Brody in Jaws. I mean, that's not a huge transformation, no. and yet he goes from being he's this, on the water. I mean, he's on the water. <laughs> what more do you need? Oh, I just recently rewatched Jaws, the masterpiece. It's so oh, good. Sure. Terrible. So moment. good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what's next? Bahar writes, Hi Collider team, I love your show and watch it every day. We were told that the Warcraft trailer would be released a few weeks after San Diego Comic Con, but it's been a few months and we've still yet to see anything. My question is, what happened and when are we going to see a Warcraft trailer? I read in an interview with Duncan Jones, he was saying November next month mm. that they're going to do one. I, yeah, I, I had heard that they were going to release one, but I think what happened was, because I, I, I think you, you were at, a, right. at Hall H as well. I think when they released it, I think they were expecting people to be like their minds to be blown, but it was just good. It wasn't like great. And I think they wanted to spend more time on the visual effects because it, it looked good, but it still looked like a video game. And I think they wanted people to have a better like uh, idea of it. What do I, you guys think? I felt like I was watching uh, my friend play the video game. And I also felt like I was watching some scene from the Hobbit, the Battle of the Five Armies, which is mm. not what I wanted to see from Warcraft. I know it's based on a game, and I think one of the big problems or one of the issues that they're going to have to overcome is that you're not just facing an enemy that's all CGI. It's not like there's a bunch of human beings that are facing bad guys that are CGI. There's people that you're rooting for that are entirely CGI or motion capture, performance capture created, and that has to look realistic enough to where you can bond with those characters emotionally, and that trailer did not do that job well. There's some other really cool things about the trailer. Like, the action looks awesome. It looks like a fun, epic movie, but it just did didn't have that, you know, that awesome, oh, man, I can't wait to see that reaction that we thought we were going to get from Comic-Con. So I understand why they might want to take a little more time before they show the footage to the rest of the world. Uh, this scares me, honestly, from what you... I haven't seen the movie, mm -hmm. uh, the trailer, and from hearing from you guys, I know how excited you guys both were. And until today and Comic-Con, I haven't heard you guys talk about it no. at all. And it's like it's one of those things that everyone was talking about, the Deadpool trailer and other things, and no one was really talking about that trailer. And I love Duncan Jones. I love yeah. I love Moon and I love Source Code. Um, and I really want to see him take this step. And I want to see him be one of the guys responsible for the for the video game boom, um, movie video game movie boom. And it really it's it's disheartening to hear that it looks like the Hobbit. I wanted to, I wanted to hear it looked like Lord of the Rings. But but time is not necessarily of the essence yet with no. the movie with the trailer coming out because from a marketing standpoint the movie comes out in 2016. I think the summer 2016. Yeah. So having a first teaser trailer come out sometime around Thanksgiving or even Christmas is fine. Yeah, but that's you know? not but that's not the even even if they put all the time and effort into it, it's the fact that they're it, they're doing like you said doing the same thing Hobbit did is where I think even. I th to hear people that were in the movie say things along the line of that there shouldn't have been as much CGI for The Hobbit, you know, and and if, like, if you look at like the orcs in Lord of the Rings, so much more devastating and powerful because they were dudes in makeup, you know, they were dude, and and that's kind of what I was hoping we get. We get a lot more of that. And and look, I have not seen the trailer, so I don't know. I'm just going off of things that I've heard from 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 these guys and other people too. But I, I hope that there's more practical effects as well as CGI. You have to have CGI yes. in this movie. Yeah, Christian, I'm with you. I haven't seen the trailer either, but um, you know, I love Duncan Jones. I think he's an excellent filmmaker. I know he's a new filmmaker, he's a young filmmaker, but I think he has such potential. And similarly, I would love to see the um, the video game boom happen. Um, that being said, I did want to mention, you know, we, um, you know, in terms of the CG characters and things like that, you know, I love what they've done in the Planet of the Apes movies. And if there's ever, you know, a positive case for a CG character, Character, a CG creature, it's what they've been able to do right. in those movies. So here's hoping that it's more along those lines. That's also straight up performance capture as Absolutely. well, too. I just Absolutely. want to make like if you're telling me if you were telling me that this was performance capture uh, and not just not just CGI, like that, that, that the creatures were people. I think it was doing a the performances. Good mix. I think it was pretty. Yeah, good it was mixed. That's great. That I'm, I'm like I said, I haven't seen it, so I'm on, I'm on board for that because yeah, to take like CG, you have to, Planet of the Apes, one of my favorite. Uh, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes was one of my favorite movies um, last year, and. And CGI, you have you can't do that movie without CGI. Yeah. So I, that's that's what I mean. I know it was just a short clip, but I didn't get that emotional response or mm -hmm. connection to the characters like I did with Dawn right. of the Planet of the Apes. Right. Like with that one, I'm like, oh, I feel for those characters. I'm on their side. And I think that's what they wanted to do with the orcs on this. I just don't think they succeeded, at least not yet. 
All right, uh, now on to our box office predictions. We do this every week, presented by our friends at AMC Theaters, is where we predict what happens and what the rankings are for this weekend's box office. So, uh, Mark, why don't you start us off here? All right, you want to get the correct answer out of the gate, <laughs> don't you, Dennis? Uh, coming in at number five this week, I'm going to have Hotel Transylvania 2. At number four, I'm going to have The Martian. And then my top three are going to be three new ones in theaters this week. Weekend. At number three, I'm going to have Crimson Peak. At number two, I'm going to have Bridge of Spies. And of course, number one, I'm going to have Woodlawn, the faith-based movie that's, of course, going to make $100 million because every other one does as well. Not really. I have Goosebumps at number one. I think Goosebumps is going to take enough of that horror movie family. We want to see something a little mm -hmm. scary dollar away from Crimson Peak to bump Crimson Peak down to number three. And Tom Hanks, Steven Spielberg, there's such a huge demographic for a movie like Bridge of Spies. I think it comes in at a solid number two. Christian, we have a similar list, um, except mine's right. Uh, I am going <laughs> to also hurts. at number five have Hotel Transylvania, and at number four I actually have Bridge of Spies. Mm -hmm. Then three I have Crimson Peak, two I have The Martian, and then one at Goosebumps. And I think that they're all going to be very close in in dollars. I think that it's going to be it's there's not going to be like a clear cut. Oh, this one made twenty thirty million dollars more. It's they're going to be within like five, six, two, three million dollars of each other. Clark? For me, um, I have Hotel Transylvania at number five as well. I, and this pains me to do because I am such a fan of Crimson Peak and I am such a fan of Guillermo. However, I am going to put it at four. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put it at four because it's R-rated. Um, you know, there's been a lot of weird buzz about is it a horror movie? Is it a romance? I think it's the messaging somewhere got confusing. And I'm worried that bad word of mouth, or not bad word of mouth, but disappointed yeah. word of mouth is going to ding it a little bit. So um, if it were up to me, Crimson Peak would be number one, but that's a different story. So number three, I have The Martian. Number two, I have Bridge of Spies. And number one, I have Goosebumps. Okay. I got a little bit different than you guys. I have number five, Hotel Transylvania. Number four, I also have Crimson Peak. And that's a movie I feel like even if, because right now it's kind of got mixed reviews, even if it was like super positive, I don't know how well it could would do. I don't know how well it appeals to the mainstream audience. Honestly, I don't know why they didn't release Crimson Peak in February. Mm -hmm. I think that it should have been this cold, atmospheric, you know, kind of weird, dark love story. I think that that's probably, I, I don't know. Well, that's they were just, trying to get the Halloween crowd. Of course yeah. they were, and I totally get that, and yeah. that makes perfect sense, but I think when you actually take into consideration what the movie is, yeah. a different release might have been smarter. Mm -hmm. But it's a, I think it's a great movie, and I'm glad it I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna it. I'm going to look at it. I'm going to watch it today. Um, um, three, Bridge of Spies. Two, The Martian. I think it's going to hold over well. I mean, it's just got po such positive word of mouth, and, and it didn't fall off that much last week. And then number one, Goosebumps, which I haven't seen yet, but I, I, I'm not sure. Like you, I think you saw it. You liked it. I've seen the movie. Yeah, I, I, I dug it okay, and I think it's a really good movie for the demographic it's aimed at for kids, and it's just a matter of if they are excited to see Goosebumps, if enough people want to go see Goosebumps and enough people grew up with that in their consciousness to want to go see the film adaptation of it, because from seeing the movie, they throw all the Goosebumps novels mm -hmm. at you at the same time. There's a lot of cool creatures to look at, so I think it'll barely be number one. Okay. Who, who won last week? Last week, Do you remember? The Martian. Martian. No, 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 right no, 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 no. Yeah. I, I'm talking. You quiet. <laughs> oh, who won? Uh, I, I, me, you, and Roca. Yeah. I don't. It definitely wasn't Roca because yeah. he was he was throwing stuff. We need uh, to tally. I mean, we need yeah, to tally this we up. Should. We, should, we, should, we should talk on Monday. Who won? Yes. Well, they I usually do. If, if somebody got five out of five... Well, John, when he gets the, it right, yeah. he's, all, <laughs> he's all over it. Yeah. He's all over it. If, if, I, if I did a Friday and did a Monday and I won, God forbid that ever happened, I would totally point out that I had actually won the box office. Right. I think last week so many people were shocked at just how poorly Pan did. Yeah, I don't remember where we didn't. put it because you and I had like the same exact list. I think we had it two or three. Yeah. I think it was two. I think we had Martian coming in and we had Pan at number two. We okay. thought, okay, the pan name is right, going to bring right. people in, no matter about the reviews. Right. Well, Soroka was right on. He said it was going to make about fifteen million. That's what it made. Mm -hmm. But, um, but yeah, he. I don't even think he knew what movies were coming. Yeah, out. that's the movie we didn't talk about. I mean, how big? It's not even going to be on the top five of this weekend, and it just opened last week. And the budget was $150 million. That's crazy. I just yeah. read an article that um, because of part of and partially because Pan did so poorly now, um, Alexander Skarsgård's uh, Tarzan movie, they're starting to get a little bit nervous about that. 
Is Joe Wright directing that? I, no, right. Joe Wright's not directing it, but I think it's the idea of this like old-fashioned property. It's the idea that Skarsgård isn't quite an, um, a leading man. Oh, that's yet. see, that's and I don't, I don't uh, doubt at all that that that's that's so silly studio thinking because that's that's the way. Like when when something when a property does really well, everybody yes. tries to copy mm -hmm. it, and then if it does really bad, everyone gets scared. I still say, and I and Joe Wright is still an okay director, but he is the reason that movie was terrible. He, the Joe Wright decisions in that movie were terrible. I the, the singing I Teen say Spirit, saying like, <laughs> I think there's absolutely you could do Tarzan, and Skarsgård absolutely has presence and could pull it off. But you're also a dude who saw Pan and didn't like yeah. it because that. I'm somebody who didn't see Pan because I had no desire to see it. And so I think that the studio is like, well, we just want to make sure that people still are aware of Tarzan because it's not just Pan. It's also like, look at something like The Man from Uncle, which is a TV show that nobody had heard of in 40 years, or something like The Lone Ranger, which is something like, like it wasn't a good movie to begin with, but it also, it was a TV show that was so long ago, it just wasn't in the consciousness, like something like Goosebumps might be. Right. So Tarzan hasn't been around, he hasn't been swinging on vines yeah. and a long time. It's been a long time yeah, since Johnny Weissmuller was running around. But still, around. I still go. I still go back and forth. That if you put a good script and a good director about anything, depending on how you cut the trailer and depending on how you execute, how you write, and the performance that you get, you can make anything watchable if you get the word of mouth behind it. So it's it is a matter of marketability, and you're going to have to put this money into it, obviously, because it's an epic movie. But you can absolutely do Tarzan because it's it's not it's not because Man from Uncle and Tarzan are totally different. Everyone knows who Tarzan is now, and you were you were actually one. You were, there were a lot of people that really were interested in Pan. And, and as yeah, far as, I mean, I, because it's Peter Pan and they, they and the idea of a prequel to how Peter Pan did that wasn't that had never really been done in the movies anyway. And I thought it was pretty interesting. But I do think that the execution of it was done terribly. All right. What's next? None of you guys included Woodlawn in your top five. Even I, with the yeah. success of... You joked around about I it. I joked around, but it's also because... And I would have thrown it in there ahead of Hotel T, but because it's only opening in 1,500 theaters, I think it'll do around right. like but seven or eight. But with the success of War Room, like but, that came out of left Christian, field. None of us even... Weren't you and I... Didn't you and I do a box office prediction for another faith-based film, and, and it turned out that weekend that it... Like, no, correct. it didn't even make it in yeah, there. Like we, it, we both we thought both it was going to go... We both put it in there yeah. because of exactly what right. you're talking about. Yeah. Out, and and it just kind of crashed and burned. It's interesting, and you know, it's interesting because you could have something like this. I wouldn't be surprised if yeah. next no. week this thing hits like two or even one, because especially with Sean Astin and and you know the, the you got Rudy, Rudy back and you yeah. got the evil coach from Varsity Blues in there. right. So I, I don't know. I mean, it's I wouldn't be surprised, but I I, I don't know. I don't know how it was marketed. Also, the mm -hmm. other thing is too that there are times that we that it can be marketed very heavily in in the Christian community to where we maybe won't see the way that they're mm -hmm. they're marketed through the churches and stuff too. Um, and then maybe this one was or wasn't. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But to <laughs> Ashley's point though, I could see it doing it because. It's a sports movie too, so you can kind of sucker in the sports fans too, as well as the faith-based community, and and get them to see it. It's more open than something like, I mean, that War Room. I had no clue right. what that right. movie. Right. At least this one, I'm like, okay, it's football. But the last mm -hmm. one that that we both did the prediction for had, um, it was ba wasn't it based on a book? Wasn't it like about the heaven is or heaven is, heaven is oh, for right. real? Is right? that, oh, yeah. Well, you know, that also had Hayden Christensen, right? Is that the one? Is that yeah, the that, that, that's not the one that. No, I know that the one is the one we're talking about, though, yeah. wasn't it? Wasn't the Hayden Christensen? One? Yeah, I think yeah, so. That's the one we were talking about, and that's might be something as well too. I mean, you know, he's not the best actor. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what's no next? <laughs> Munir writes, "Hi guys, I love your shows, especially the new TV recap ones. So I just watched Moon for the first time. Thank you, Dennis. Sam Rockwell has been around for a while and doesn't get enough recognition for how brilliant he is. Who are some other actors that you believe deserve to be more of a household name? Thanks, Christian. Nate Parker." Nate Parker from Arbitrage yeah. and in Beyond yes. the Lights. Mm -hmm. um, this guy is a superstar and should be a superstar. He is a guy that I have been uh, uh, hoping that if they do the John Stewart for Green Lantern, that they they choose him. If it's you know anything going from genre films, if you put him in a Star Wars movie, you put him in a Marvel or a DC movie, he'll be great. You can put him in an, in, a, in a Tarantino movie, he'd be great. He is someone I want to see go mainstream. 
Mark, yeah. there's always this guy that shows up in movies, and his name is Scoot McNary, and oh, he yeah. always oh. gives a great performance, and he has a variety of roles that he's done in different styles of movies. So I really like him. Then there's an older actor that you probably maybe have heard of, Hal Holbrook. He literally <laughs> makes me cry every time he's on screen. It doesn't matter what he's playing. Remember every he was, time Water for Elephants. He was in the Water for Elephants <laughs> movie. He, he plays up. old Bob Pattinson in that movie, <laughs> and he's in it for five minutes, and I was weeping both times yeah. he's in it. He bookends that movie, and he's just so His good. name is literally Old Bobby Pattinson. Hats in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> All right, oh, Clark. Um, I was gonna go with Joel Edgerton. Joel oh, Edgerton, yeah. every time he shows up, I think is excellent. Uh, he's in Warrior. Um, and he's on the cusp right now. Yeah, too, he yeah. really is. He was just in Black Mass. That might have been the thing that's gonna kick him over. But he's so good in The Gift, which yeah, came out yeah. earlier this Directed year. Directed and wrote it. Yeah, he did. And um, I think the thing that kind of keeps Joel Edgerton from being that mainstream um, famous is that he's a chameleon. Mm -hmm. He disappears into every single movie that he makes. I never recognize Joel Edgerton. And the other person I wanted to mention who is more of a name, but I don't think she's as big as I would love her to be, is Rose Byrne. I think Rose Byrne is awesome. And she's another uh, Australian chameleon <laughs> who disappears into everything. But I think she can do drama. I think she can do comedy. I think she can be silly. I think she can sing. I think she can act. I think she's just the best. So I'd love to see both of them be more mainstream. You know who has gone mainstream but not hit superstar status? Two people, actually. Um, definitely definitely household names. But Clive Owen was a guy I thought was oh, going to yeah. be on the verge. To I be thought like, he was going to be the next James Bond. Bond. I, everyone did. Everyone I thought did. he was going to be. I mean, he's still, he's still in, this, in the show that he's on now. But I thought he was going to be like super Superstar yeah, level, um, and then uh, the other one I just blanked on. I had um, shoot, come back to me. I'll totally throw forgot. one in there because Gark brought up Bra uh, Black Mass, and somebody else who I thought was great in Black Mass and is great every time you see him on screen is a young up and comer named Jesse Plemons. Every time you yes. see him in movie or TV show, he's going to give like a. Sometimes it's a little like a scary psychopathic performance, but he can do other things as well. So keep an eye out. Yeah, I can't. The, remember. the gift for me was probably the, my biggest surprise of the year. I I, I went into it it's having very low expectations. Mm -hmm. Maybe thought it was going to be a fun, cheesy thriller, but actually had some things to say and, and done very well, and Joel Edgerton directed it, and he also gave a great performance in it. I will be surprised if he does not get a nomination for Black Mass. Really? You um, think he's going to get it? He is so good yeah. in that mm -hmm. movie, and he almost steals the show from, from, from Johnny yeah. Depp. Uh, Eric Bana is another one. Yeah. Like He was uh, now... He some, was on the cusp as well. He yeah. was on the cusp, and he's had roles that maybe some people... I mean, even when the people thought Hulk would be the one that sent him into it, and that movie was just kind of a disappointment. A movie that I thought he was great in, and actually almost stole the show from the person who was the star of it, and the movie itself was okay, was Troy. Mm -hmm. I thought Eric Bonner, once he... and Spoiler alert! Once he dies, um, <gasps> the movie starts to go downhill because he's the most engaging part as Hector. And I want to see him do more epic stuff. I'd like to see Eric Bana being, I mean, he's a little older now, but still, he could still, I think, pull off a lot of these epic movies. Eric? Oh, yeah, oh, sorry. sorry. I'll throw the name of Mary Elizabeth Winstead in there, too. She's, she's, she's just, she's great. <laughs> Well, on the Eric Bana topic, uh, <laughs> he, uh, similar to Hugh Jackman, has this like song and dance background yeah. back in Australia. And stand-up comedy, too. Yeah, and comedy. And that's what I wanted to mention is whether or not you like This Is 40 or not, I think he's great in This Is 40. He's he's a different version of Eric Bana than we've ever, when, than we had seen before, right? Because he's always that intense, for lack of a better word, hulking presence. <laughs> um, but I thought in This Is 40, he was like, he was cool and he was funny and he was slightly edgy and it was just different for him him so i'm with you i love him i would love to see him do what, more what was he in this is 40 he was the husband you mean do you oh, mean funny I mean, people yes, funny, funny people, people. Sorry, yeah sorry, yeah, sorry, okay. sorry, sorry, yeah, sorry. yeah 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 i was trying funny i was people. thinking i was like yeah because he was a funny people too. no no it, it was you know it was avatar because when you were saying that because i was like oh yeah because well, he was also because I, I was gonna say he was also good in funny people oh, <laughs> <laughs> all i could see was the front house actually that suburban right, california right. house and him out on the front lawn and yes but yes thank you that's what i mean i think two actors idris elba and benedict cumberbatch are two actors that are on that cusp there. Yeah, they'll be like, superstars by the next month. Yeah, yeah, you have Doctor Strange coming out for yeah. Benedict Cumberbatch and with Idris Elba. He's just, he's got that star presence to yeah. him and I think the more, he has that, uh, what is that, No Beasts Beast for No, for no Nation. Nation. No Nation. Yeah. That's coming out, that's, good. that's getting a lot of good buzz yeah. and, and I think they both have star quality. Uh, female side, uh, Alicia Vikander oh, from yeah. Ex Machina yeah. and uh, Man From U.N.C.L.E., which I didn't love as much as other people did, but I thought she was great in it. She's electric in everything she does. Another person who's going to be a superstar tomorrow is Rebecca Ferguson. I was just mm -hmm. about to say. Like she, I mean, they just, what was that movie? She just got announced with the movie last night. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, she about? was in Mission Impossible right, 5, yeah, of course, and then but she's this, in The Snowman with the Michael snowman, Fassbender. Right. Yeah. All these names you guys are throwing are great. They got a long way to go before they're the next Hal Holbrook. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right. Uh, what's Bobby next? Pat. Robert Miller writes, I've been watching you guys for a while now and like it when a question comes up about different jobs on the movie set. You guys use the word cinematographer a lot. I was wondering what exactly he slash she does and what is his slash her relationship with the director. Keep bringing the filth. Well, cinematographer is in charge of the camera work, all the, the shots that you see, the lighting. They kind of they don't necessarily have to be the guy on the camera, they can have someone else be doing it, but they're the, in charge of that. And their relationship with the director is they they need to execute what the director wants, much like the actors do, the costume designers, set designers, everyone is supposed to rally around what a director wants and their vision, and the cinematographer either comes to the director with some ideas, or the director comes with him some ideas, and they kind of hash it out together. Okay, we're gonna shoot it this way, it's gonna look this way. Everything from whether you know they're going to shoot on film or digital, or and what kind of lighting and mood lighting and, and all that stuff. I mean, James Cameron um, for uh, when he took over for the Alien franchise and he did Aliens, he had to fire the cinematographer that they had because the cinematographer wanted to shoot it like the proper way. He wanted to shoot it like everything's well lit, and and, and James Cameron didn't want that. His vision was. I want it kind of dark and gritty. I don't want you to be able to see everything. And, and he ended up getting a different person to execute his vision. So I, I, that's just an example. What about you guys? Well, oftentimes cinematographers and, and directors work very closely yeah. together and work frequently together. Yeah. Um, Bill Pope and Sam Raimi have been working together for a million years. Bill Pope's a great, a great cinematographer. And, uh, and also um, Wally Pfister. Wally Pfister and Chris Nolan work together a lot. And um, side note, I've had the pleasure of chatting with Wally Pfister and, and moderating Q&A with him for a long period of time. He is a cool dude. He's a really cool dude. And I hope he gets back behind the camera because we know Transcendence wasn't necessarily the best thing but i think yeah. he no. <laughs> i think he knows film i think he has it he do, he is capable of a vision and obviously you know you think of the cinematography in a lot of chris nolan's movies and it's it's iconic in a lot of ways so a lot of times those directors and those uh, cinematographers work closely together and repeatedly yeah it seems like the cinematographer is always the right hand man of the director and sometimes or a woman and then sometimes they can lean on them more or less depending on who the director is somebody like chris nolan has a vision that they want wally fister to help them realize then other times if it's a first-time director, somebody newer like a Russell Crowe or Angelina Jolie who's making the transition, these are cinematographers that they have had who have done movies that they've acted in that they trust and they rely on. So, like, when Angelina Jolie made Unbreakable, is that the Unbroken. 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 It's like you need to rely on somebody else who might have a little more experience than you. And obviously, somebody like Roger Deakins can be the star of their own yeah. movie. Like, when we were talking about Sicario, we might have felt a little bit differently about how much we love the movie, but the way that Deakins sets up shots, it's like you actually notice that that that's a cinematographer. That's a huge achievement. Yeah, it was uh, what I was going to bring up. As someone like Deakins, is that even though you have a great director, and I mess up his name every time, Villeneuve. Uh, yeah, Denis. Yeah, every time uh, Denis. when he is, you know that his vision is absolutely part of it, but he's able to tell Deakins that. And then you know, like Mark was saying, you know when it's Deakins. You can yeah. tell. And that's, it's. I don't say it's rare, because when you look, if you're looking at a movie from a cinematographer, and then you look him up and you go, oh, okay, that makes sense, because i looking at the past work. But when you're watching the movie and you're like, oh, this has got to be Deacon. Mm -hmm. Like he, he's he's like he's like the under, he's like the Ronda Rousey hey, of cinematography. Yeah, him and Lubeski <laughs> and and um uh. oh my gosh, it was in my head and then it just went out. Dean Cundy, mm -hmm. Dean Cundy yeah. is shot like everything. Every movie that you love, Jurassic Park, Halloween, right. and everything in between. I mean, he worked with Spielberg and Zemeckis and all of these people. Like, Dean Cundy has been on everything. Yeah, and I think that when you get, like, an old school guy like that, but then you get a new, sc new school guy with... with, with uh, and how old is Deacons? I mean... He's pretty old. He's, he's older, like, but he's older. But I mean, even that, when I say new school, as far as, like, the technology that they're using and stuff now, too, like, as, as in regards to how... You have these guys that look at, I mean, because Deacon's transitioned because he's been yeah. around for a bit, but he he's able to, because you look at the way digital filmmaking in general, like the, the, adjust, the adjustments that the cinematographers had to do and, and the way that they have now made that an art form. I mean, Deacon's, I think, right now, like I said, is the Ronda Rousey of cinematography. And, and he's not one of those guys that, like, Quentin, where he's like, oh, I, only film, only film. He transitioned to digital, and he shoots it, in and he's, right. he's fine with it. Same with Lubeski as well. Oh, one thing I think people don't notice is because cinematographers aren't like direct directors they start in the pre-production production post-production post so they live with a movie for many many years cinematographers don't they come right. they shoot it they leave that's why if you look at a list uh, of their credits you'll see in one year it's like three four movies right. where a director does one every two three years and 
Yeah, that, that might be the job where you get like it not as not not enough credit as you might deserve because a lot of even like like people who are casual film fans are when I go to a movie and I'm throwing popcorn in my face and I'm watching Jurassic World I'm like oh that was directed awesome but a lot of the reason why you think the directing was so good is the because looks, the cinematographer yeah. has a lot of talent so keep that in mind kids send a cinematographer you know a nice card. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the last question. Zach writes, so I was having a debate with my brother about Star Wars and whether it's more of a fantasy or sci-fi property. We all know it's a blend of the two, but I always thought of Star Wars as fantasy set in a sci-fi setting. Star Wars follows more of the tropes that are usually found in fantasy, such as the theme of good versus evil, heroes on a quest, and a dark lord. What do you think? Does Star Wars fall more in the line of fantasy or a sci-fi genre? Thanks. I will leave Christian to, to start this off. Oh, as the, God, the, Dennis. You're making a huge mistake. <laughs> it is 100% in the fantasy realm. It, uh, straight out of George Lucas's mouth. Uh, if you read how Star Wars conquered the universe, it is talked about in great detail. It was always set as a fairy tale that happens to be in space on other planets. Um, that's the reason why you can hear things blowing up in space when you normally can't. Wait, what? Uh, um, <laughs> it, you can hear, like, there's, there's, it, there is good, there is evil, there are these themes. It was taken from all different mythologies of, uh, of, of things from the past, as far as our history, as far as fairy tales, and it's a blend of fantasy. It's absolutely not just sci-fi. Yeah, I mean, look, if I work at a blockbuster, then I'm probably by default throwing the movie in the sci-fi section, but there's not a lot of blockbusters anymore. I would also might consider putting it in the Western Thank genre. Thank you, Mark Ellis. It's Up a, top, that's what I was going to th say. There's so many Western elements to this, and Mark Hamill was talking about the movie recently. I think he's been quoted before as saying that when he was making Star Wars, he was considering it generally a comedy. So this thing can be considered a variety of different ways, but I would have to agree with Christian that it is a space fantasy film. I, I am so glad this question came up because I was just uh, having in this conversation, or I was actually not participating in the conversation, but I was listening to a girlfriend of mine who is a die-hard Star Wars fan, and she was like testing somebody's Star Wars street cred, and she's like, ultimate <laughs> question, what is it, sci-fi or fantasy? And of course, the person said fantasy, and she was like, correct, you have passed. <laughs> So that's my that was the litmus test, and so I was like, I better say fantasy. Yeah, today. it's definitely a, a fantasy story with fantasy characters and and the kind of the mythos, uh, but it's just a sci-fi setting. And then visually, though, when you see it, you look at it, and you think it's science fiction. Yeah, so. it's sci-fi fantasy. Yeah, it's, it is, and it's funny too because some people still don't have a total grip on what science fiction is. Because and this argument comes up, and we're going to have it again in the comment board today when I say. Gravity is science fiction. People don't. Who says it isn't? A lot of commenters say really? that it's not. Yes, not you'll, Neil deGrasse you'll, Tyson. You'll see, you'll see it. In, you'll see it in the board today. Gravity is total science fiction. Just because it happens in, in it, does, it doesn't happen in the future. It doesn't mean it's not science fiction. Hey, hey wasn't The Martian a real story? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Have yeah. you seen those things on yes, online I know. where we people joked about it in our yeah. review and said it because it looks so real? I thought it was like so. Like, we're like, like, oh, did they actually shoot this yeah, on yeah, Mars? Yeah, is yeah. This, is this historical? <laughs> like, yeah. are they actually telling us something? I always based thought, on a true story. I mean, look, look, we can argue for days about what Star Wars is, but I, I never considered it like a fantasy film the same way that I consider Wizard of Oz fantasy. No. When I I think of fantasy films i generally think they take place like on earth and or somewhere around or like a magical kingdom when you put it in outer space my brain automatically goes to science fiction but if you had to classify it would probably be space fantasy western western I mean, when you're younger though you don't all you see is the spaceships right. the lightsabers and all that so you think science fiction because you don't you're not really understanding the story right. in terms of well, fantasy. It definitely has science fiction elements. Yeah, of sure. course it does, but it's not as far as one category. That's why I say sci-fi fantasy. Like you have to tag it with fantasy because yeah. that's that's the last thing that should be leaving it your mouth. It is an adventure about film it. too. Yeah, <laughs> sure. It's got all those elements. I mean, he's got it's it's the swashbuckling. Remember where George Lucas pulled all this stuff from? You know, the Flash Gordon serials from back in the day, and even that scene of Luke and Leia in Episode Four when he's swinging yeah. across. You know, that's that's like told that comes from his childhood. So you're yeah. saying that a Star Wars was a vid uploaded on YouTube. There'd be a lot of different tags. You oh would yeah, have to put on. I, I, there. I can already read <laughs> the comments. All right, the, the, the debate. I can't wait to read them honestly mm -hmm. because I'm very curious to what you guys think out there, if, whether or not it's sci-fi 
or sci-fi fantasy. And along the Western uh, angle, it's also he uh, George Lucas is a huge fan of Kurosawa, so yes. he borrowed a lot from the samurai movies as well mm-hmm. for it. So. And hopefully, uh, Episode Seven is going to be a little martial arts too. I mean, you got some guys from the raid. You might have stormtroopers with lightsabers. Let's get some fighting going. What I'm hearing from Episode Seven is that you're even going to go more into the fantasy realm, as where there's going to be like castles and and very mm-hmm. medieval and kind of Lord of the Rings meets Star Wars, which is kind of always what I wanted to see. Oh. All right. Ashley, what's up? Where, or what would you call Star Wars? You know, it's interesting because I never thought of Star Wars to be a fantasy until Christian was like, "Oh, definitely a fantasy." <laughs> I guess your, your points definitely make sense, but I always thought of it to be a sci-fi. I always thought of it that way, but now that I hear your points, I, I definitely get it. Okay, all right, guys, uh, that's it for day, today's show. I want to thank the people joining me at this table. Clark, where can people find you? They can find me on Instagram, Twitter, and Periscope at Clark Wolf, Clark with an E, Wolf with an E, and they can find me right here on Collider Video a week from Monday for the Supergirl after oh, show, yeah, which right. I am very excited about. Mark. Uh, you can find me watching Monday Night Football on uh. Monday. Uh, in the meantime, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at 5150Ellis. Tonight I'm at the Comedy Store. Tomorrow night I'm at Hypno Comics. It's a cool comic store in Ventura, California doing stand-up. A lot of Star Wars jokes. Will I call it a sci-fi? I don't know. Christian, uh, you can find me here twice talking Star Wars. The first time's on Wednesday nights with our brand new Rebels After Show. And that is myself and John Campia. Going to be looking for two more hosts. Stay tuned on that. Get out of here. Uh, You better start liking the Giants. Um, And make sure that you find this character next to myself and John Campia every Thursday on Collider Jedi Council, where we took... You're not in it. You thought it was science fiction. Uh, (laughs) So Collider Jedi Council. Hashtag it, Collider Jedi Council. Get your questions out there and follow me at Christian Harloff on Twitter and Instagram. And our lovely host, Ashley, where can people find you? Twitter, Instagram, at Ashley Mova. <laughs> Happy Friday, guys. <laughs> and you guys can find me on Twitter at Think Hero on Instagram, Dennis.TZNG. I want to let you guys know I've been doing a lot of sketch videos on my YouTube channel, which you can check out at uh, Think Hero Pro. Uh, also, don't forget, uh, we have uh, all these movies coming out. You can check them out at amctheaters.com. Check it for your showtimes and ticket information. Also, don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel. That's YouTube.com slash Collider Videos, and we'll see you guys next week.